Bhagavad Gita, its feeling and philosophy, Swami B. V. Tripurari. In the service of my divine guardians, Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada and Srila Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Deva Goswami Maharaja, this book is dedicated to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's spiritual great grandchildren who are scattered throughout the globe. May they bring dignity and new light to his divine mission. Forward. The Bhagavad Gita is one of the greatest classics, not only of world religion, but of world philosophy and the great tradition of yoga. If we had to choose a single book to represent the spiritual and cultural traditions of India, we would certainly have to choose the Gita. A person who has not studied the Gita has missed something significant in our global wisdom heritage. In fact, if we were to put together the monotheism of the Western world with the non-theistic karma-based meditation traditions of Buddhism and the Far East, we would come up with something like the Bhagavad Gita, which combines theism with karma, rebirth and self-realization and encompasses global religion and experimental spirituality. The scope of the Gita is enormous. It covers devotional mysticism, meditative insight, cosmic vision, practical psychology and even social activism. The keys to all aspects of life, mind and consciousness. In every generation over thousands of years, it has provided inspiration for thinkers, leaders and yogis in India. Much of the inspiration for India's independence movement came from the study of the Gita by such prominent figures as Gandhi, Tilak and Aurobindo. The Gita has been a key text for the great gurus of yoga who have come to the West, such as Paramahamsa, Yogananda and Srila Prabhupada. Through gurus like these, the Gita has provided unceasing and undiminishing inspiration to people all over the world. The Gita remains relevant today even though it was written before the time of Christ. Its instructions are clear, concise, logical and scientific. Not just appeals to faith, belief, personality or culture. If you study the Gita deeply and sincerely, its teachings can transform your life and awareness. That is why the Bhagavad Gita remains one of the most popular books in the world today, a perennial bestseller. A number of translations and interpretations of the Gita exist. In India alone, literally thousands of commentaries on the text circulate. Because of the multifaceted nature of its approach, the Gita can be viewed from various angles, much like a brilliant gemstone. It can reflect, magnify and enhance the light within us. Many great thinkers have looked to the Gita for guidance and consolation, even though their worldviews or conceptions of divinity may differ from another. Each philosophical system in the Hindu tradition has looked to the Gita for light and produce a number of commentaries that bring out the richness of the Gita for people of diverse temperaments and inclinations. Despite its broad appeal, the Gita is not just a general work of practical wisdom for all of humanity. 
It contains specific teachings for followers of particular yoga paths, as many in the West are discovering through their study of the yoga tradition. These teachings focus on the relevance of the Gita's message for sadhana or individual spiritual practice. The Gita is a manual of self-realization and God-realization for those who are on the path, covering all the main yoga approaches, knowledge, jnana, devotion, bhakti, and service, karma. The Gita is arguably the prime textbook of the yoga tradition, being longer and more detailed than the yoga sutras. In fact, to understand the sutras, which are often brief and obscure, one should study them along with the Gita. Those wishing to become yoga teachers in the traditional sense of the term should avail themselves of the yogic insights of the Gita. Some traditions in India consider that Patanjali, the compiler of the Yoga Sutras, was himself a follower of Krishna. Patanjali is identified with Ananta, the great serpent of potential creative energy, on whom Vishnu reclines. Krishna, the speaker of the Gita, is the fullest expression of Vishnu manifest on earth, the Purna Avatara. The Gita addresses all the main topics of classical yoga, including the Yamas and Niyamas, Samadhi, meditation, concentration, Pratyahara, and even a brief mention of Asana. The Gita is said to be a Yoga Shastra, and each of its chapters is said to relate to a particular yoga approach. Looking at the Gita in light of yoga helps us to uncover the depths of its teachings. Yet, despite the growing popularity of the Gita through the expansion of yoga in the West, including the many versions of the Gita in the English language, few are able to probe the depth of its teaching or consider the original Sanskrit and its many traditional commentaries. Swami B. V. Tripurari is one of the few writers to do so, and his version of the Gita is an excellent vehicle for readers in the West to explore these roots. His translation and interpretation of the Gita is clear, detailed and true to the original meaning of the text. By explaining the Sanskrit, Swami Tripurari helps readers understand the original text. Swami's study of the Gita is no mere quick analysis. It goes into depth, reflecting on the meaning of each word used and its subtle implications. He also brings in references to important Vaishnava teachers and the great tradition of Gita analysis that is seldom given its proper due. I have known Swami Tripurari for more than 20 years. I used to write for his Clarion Call magazine, which was one of the most insightful and innovative publications of its time on Vedic issues. Strangely, however, it was only a year or two ago that I actually met him in person. Swami Tripurari, though born an American, has the appearance, expression and even mannerism of a seasoned Swami from India. He has been able to bridge both East and West in his own life and teachings. His Gita reflects this sensitivity and attention as well. 
Swami Tripurari speaks of the Gita as both philosophy and feeling. Today, philosophy is largely a bad word in the West, particularly in the United States. We don't want theories. We want something practical, something to experience quickly, not something to contemplate over time. And most of what we call philosophy in our educational system has little relevance to our lives, reflecting rather the obscurities of science, linguistics, economics or politics. In the spiritual tradition of India, however, the term generally rendered as philosophy is darshana, which means a way of seeing. It is something someone has actually experienced, rather than simply a matter of speculation or conjecture. The ability to arrive at such an experience rests on a particular lifestyle, discipline and spiritual practice. Such a philosophy is a distillation of wisdom that can guide us forward like a ray of light. We all need such philosophies to make our thought and perception meaningful and linked to the transcendent. In the philosophies or darshanas of India, feeling has always had an important role. Deep insight is not possible without a depth of feeling to sustain it. Truth, after all, is a matter of conviction and has a certain passion to it. Even the most abstract of India's philosophers, the great non-dualist Shankara, composed some of the most beautiful Sanskrit devotional poetry. Our higher mind, what is called buddhi in Sanskrit, which the Gita empathizes, is key to the practice of yoga. It brings together deep feeling and direct knowing like the two wings of a bird, lifting the minds to new levels. To grasp the real philosophy of the Gita requires a consummate sense of feeling, the ability to feel the divine presence both in oneself and in the world as directly as one would feel the presence of a lover. Current, academic approaches to the Gita downplay the vitality and passion of the Gita and turn it into a little more than a fossil or museum piece. Attempts to secularize the Gita by removing religion from it and making it into a kind of life management strategy miss the deep devotion that the Gita honors and requires. Though such attempts can make the Gita accessible to the non-religious mind. Swami Tripurari deftly navigates both of these poles and provides an alternative that shows both the rational and the devotional side of the text, which supports rather than contradicts one another. Some people have the impression that the devotional traditions of India, the Bhakti Yoga paths, are a kind of mindless emotionalism punctuated by unintelligible chants that brainwash people. Nothing could be further from the truth. The followers of Bhakti Yoga have produced a vast tradition of philosophical texts, commentaries and painstaking textual and logical analysis clear principles of cosmology, psychology and human behavior and poignant comments on current affairs. This intellectually rigorous bhakti 
is what we find in the work of Swami Tripurari. Besides an accessory commentary on the Gita, his work is also a good introduction to the broader tradition of Bhakti philosophy, showing that it is alive and well not only in India but also in the West. He quotes from and brings in the great tradition of Vaishnava philosophy, particularly as it is represented in the works of Srila Prabhupada, India's main teacher who brought this tradition to the West some decades ago, from whom Swami Tripurari received special instruction. Both Srila Prabhupada and Swami Tripurari belong to the tradition of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, perhaps the greatest of all the devotional philosophers of the Gita, and the great lineages of thinkers that have arisen from him. Swami Tripurari has published many books and articles on all aspects of spiritual life over the last 25 years while directing a spiritual organization with global afflictions. His work deserves more attention, particularly as the subject of Bhakti Yoga again emerges into the yoga community. His Gita is probably his most important book. Swami Tripurari's commentary on the Gita is an extensive and monumental work an important addition to the literature on the Gita. It opens ground for much new study and research, particularly in the realm of spiritual practice and yoga. Through Swami Tripurari's commentary, we can gain access not only to the Gita, but also to a vast tradition of devotional thought and practice that is based upon it. This can change our view of self, world and divinity in fundamental and transformative ways. David Frasley, Santa Fe, New Mexico, March 2008